Hello, friends. Happy Friday. It's time for the Friday stream. Get hyped. I'm your hostess, Lisa. Welcome. So many of you already in the chat chatting. Um, I did a poll for the stream today. I am reading what you all chose, which is the woman who tried to make porn safe for feminism. And I'm excited to get into it. It's a little bit of feminist history. Maybe it can shed some light on where we've been, where we are now. Because I feel like these conversations are still happening now, whether like pornography is a feminist thing or not. I mean, I don't think anyone here would agree with that sentiment. So... Let's get into it, shall we? The woman who tried to make porn safe for feminism. By the way, I didn't really do too much preamble today, but um, if you're new here, I'm Lisa. Welcome. So glad to have you. Feel free to share your voice in the chat. We love to hear from lurkers here. We have a very friendly and very kind chat. So definitely, if you are new, join the conversation. The way this works is we read an article together, we get edumacated, and we stop and discuss it as we go. So I will stop and give you my thoughts and my reactions. I haven't read this article yet. I like to live react to them. Um, and yeah, so I will stop and I will also stop and read your comments. So feel free as we are going to uh, share your thoughts. And thank you, Lee, for the kindly donation. Really appreciate it. Um, Lighten says, I used to be a lurker. Lurkers, your voice is welcome here. It's a good place to practice. I think our voices as women it's literally the most important thing we have. So do not hesitate to speak up. Um, by the way, I had a great time on our stream on Tuesday. And I think Radical and I are going to try to make that kind of a regular thing to do a Tuesday stream, maybe one week on her channel, one week on my channel and have uh, some of you guys join us because that was just so, so much fun. And it's really good to practice, right? <laughs> like I think a lot of the women, they're a little nervous at first. And then the more you do it, the more used to it you get. So Existential says, remind me to tell you about my experience with feminist porn. Hint, no such thing. So that is, yeah, that's definitely like on topic for today. So I'm so excited all the gang is here. We love to see it. I really appreciate you all. And thank you all for voting in the poll too and sharing your thoughts. By the way, when it comes to the polls, the comments count for five <laughs> votes. So if there's something you really want to see, uh, you can you can hype up your your interest by commenting. All right, so let's get into this article. This came out, uh, let's see, a couple of weeks ago. Uh-oh, somebody doesn't have pants on. Um, came out on March 11th, 2024, and the subtitle of this is How the Archive of Candida Royale, a porn star turned pioneering director, landed at Harvard and inspired a new book challenging the conventional history of the sexual revolution. Okay, a new book. That sounds great. Um, we need a rad gang name. I think the gang name is Peaceful Island. Because we have a very calm and peaceful environment here, and I love it. So let's learn about Candida Royale. Let's open our minds and see what we can gain from this, learning about this woman. And I think there were some quite interesting comments on this as well. Um, and so we'll take a look at some of the comments afterwards, too. Harvard's Schlesinger Library is the nation's leading repository for women's history. That's cool. Home to the papers of the suffragists and social reformers, poets and politicians, 
the collective behind Our Bodies, Ourselves, and iconic figures like Amelia Earhart, Angela Davis, and Julia Child. Love that. But in its basement vaults, carefully preserved in a box, you can also find a rather different artifact, a costume from the 1978 pornographic comedy Hot and Saucy Pizza Girls. The movie, starring John C. Holmes as a pimp who oversees a prostitution ring masquerading as a pizza delivery service, Pizzagate, was history-making in its own way, as one of the earliest examples of what became a classic trope, porn with pepperoni. But the costume is at the Schlesinger because of another name on the bill, Candida Royale. Royale, who died in 2015, was a minor celebrity in her day. She was a porn star from the 1970s golden age who moved to the other side of the camera, producing feminist erotica that focused on female fantasies and female audiences. All right, we're getting right into it. Do you all think there is such a thing as feminist erotica, given that we don't develop our sexuality in a vacuum, we develop our sexuality in a world that is kind of dominated and determined by male sexuality. It's very hard to say like what female sexuality actually is. Juliet says, feminist erotica, isn't that an oxymoron? It just jumps out at me as being a little, I don't know. You know, I have read a lot of um, romance novels, some of which are erotica, for work, and I know a lot of women are into that, and that sort of you know, it's not visual, right? It, it's something that allows women to use their imagination and that kind of stuff. Thinking uh, like a female audience for pornography, that to me <laughs> is like oxymoronic, right? Or it just like, I don't think there's really a big demand for female to like, for females to watch this stuff. Existential says, Written erotica, perhaps. On-screen porn, no. But even written erotica is informed by patriarchy more often than not, and that's definitely true. Like, what is a female fantasy? You know what I mean? Like, what even is that? Do we even know what that is? <laughs> like, because, it, yes, it is so informed by patriarchy. It's so informed by, you know, dominant male fantasies. Ree says, why would anyone want to watch other people do that? It's gross. A common sentiment amongst women. Um, Ice Goddess says, even if the man is hot, he is still usually abusive. Even if it's written by a woman, it's so infuriating. During the so-called sex wars of the 1980s, Royale fa faced off against anti-porn feminists like Andrea Dworkin and Catherine McKinnon, who dismissed women in the profession as stooges of the patriarchy. I don't think that's an accurate portrayal really at all. That's very, that's dismissive. Um, Actually, I think they were not critical of the women. That's the thing. Radical feminists have never been critical of the women who partake in the so-called uh, sex work. Um, they've been critical of the structure that exploits women and also that creates this uh, objectified view of all women. So even women who don't participate in it really suffer because of just because of it existing. Um, Lee says, I think so, but only in the abstract, I think with, in reference to, is there like what female sexuality is or what, if there's female fantasies, it would have to be unexploited, exploitative and would likely have to be in written form. As someone else said, women's fantasies are usually for men. 
And in the 1990s, she became a godmother to the mediagenic sex positive feminists riding feminism's third wave. Today, Royale's name may ring few bells, but her voluminous archive is now housed at Harvard, where the trove of diaries, letters, photographs, scrapbooks, videos, and memorabilia is opening up a new window onto the sexual revolution. So I actually have a video about this. I don't have it linked in the description, but I'll put it in there later. But um, yeah, I did a video... I think it's called Sex Positivity Benefits Men. Um, and it's about this, like where this all came from and, and how it didn't end up being good. Like, you know, these women feminists, I don't know, took this idea of women's uh, sexual liberation which in a sense is good because there there was a lot of sexual repression and stuff that hap that was happening up through the 50s and then women did get to take control of their bodies and their destinies when the pill came out and abortion and that kind of stuff um so that's good but then they took that and it they just went too far with it basically i think Enlightened says, I also believe that feminist friendly sexual media would really only be in written form. The only true feminist sexual media would have to be written by a radical feminist hot take. Yeah, that's interesting. Like, what would that be and what would that look like? Um, Existential says, when women produce erotica informed by patriarchy, men use that as evidence of the truth of female sexuality rather than questioning why erotica has these themes. That's a really good point. And that, you know, goes to that idea that like women are often the ones, often their participation in this stuff, yeah, re it normalizes it and reinforces that it's okay. Um, and everybody gets that message, like little girls get that message, adult men get that message. So it's really up, I really do think it's up to women to refuse to participate in this stuff as much as they can. Radical says, I think it's so misguided to think that female liberation is doing the same things as men do. I totally agree. Uh, a lot of people cast the um, feminism as the struggle for equality. And uh, we sometimes often joke that in order to be equal, we would actually have to lower ourselves to men's level. So equality is not what we're going for here. We're not, you know, there are a lot of things that men participate in that are not, that women don't, like say violent crime, are we looking to achieve equality in that? Uh, maybe only by reducing the amount of violent crime that men do, not by participating in ourselves. So same thing with this pornography stuff. It's like equality in this would be to eliminate men doing it rather than to have women do more of it. So the historian Jane Kamensky with items from Royale's voluminous personal archive, which is now held at Harvard's Schlesinger Library. That is the argument made by Jane Kamensky, the historian who spearheaded the acquisition of Royale's papers. In the new biography, Candida Royale and the Sexual Revolution, A History from Below, Kamensky puts Royale at the center of an ambitious, ambivalent history that aims to un unsettle any idea of a conflict with firm battle lines. I didn't realize the text is really small on this. Let me let me make it a little bigger so you guys can see better. There we go. So Kamensky puts Royale at the center of an ambitious, ambivalent history that aims to unsettle any idea of a conflict with firm battle lines. She is way too critical and self-critical for many of the sex positive feminists, Kamensky said, and she absolutely does not fit into an anti-pornography box. So it seems like she exists in kind of a gray area. 
Um, Royale's story, Kamensky said, shows us that we have the wrong boxes. Kamensky, a leading scholar of the American Revolution, who recently left Harvard to become president of Thomas Jefferson's Monticello, Monticello, is not the person you would expect to write the biography of a conflicted late 20th century porn queen. But the sexual revolution may not be wholly different from that 18th century political struggle which divided would-be Americans against each other and within themselves far more than we remember today. It's a struggle of ideas, but also a struggle with people's bodies on the line, Kamensky said, and every gain is alloyed with loss. The, the sexual revolution may not be wholly different from the American revolution, which divided would be Americans against each other and within themselves. Wow, that's actually pretty powerful <laughs> writing right there, I think. Like, it is kind of that big of an existential question like where on the side of this are we going to put ourselves enlightened says you would have to decenter yourself from the male centered world mentally physically or both before you consider making so-called feminist erotica Nick says, we are exposed to sexual objectification of women very young, just walking past a newsstand with porn mags for everyone to see regardless of age. Okay. Is there an archive? In the 1990s, as a vogue for porn studies swept some corners of the humanities, Royale made appearances on college campuses, marveling at her climb from, I could say that word, drug addict to politically correct, successful entrepreneur spokeswoman for women's sexuality, as she wrote in her diary. Still, when Kamensky came across her obituary in September 2015, she had never heard of Royale. Kamensky was a few weeks into a new job as a faculty director at Schlesinger with an eye toward expanding its holdings beyond its predominantly upper middle class, liberal educated, Acela corridor purview, as she put it. Reading about Royale, she wondered, is there an archive? Two months later, Kamensky was passing out business cards at Royale's memorial in New York, where hundreds of guests paid tribute and snacked on cherry tomatoes from her garden. So here is a photo, a 1979 protest in Times Square by the group Women Against Pornography, WAP, we love it. Anti-porn feminists argued that women in the sex industry were victims or dupes. Yes. Lee says, could erotica that is pro-consent, non-abusive and stimulating for women be created? I think an unasked question here is if feminist porn is even something women want, right? I don't know if like porn in the visual medium is something that any women even want. And Radical asks the same question. I wonder if absent of male influences, would women desire porn at all? Um, it's an entirely male thing. I agree. Royale's executor was Veronica Vera, a Wall Street trader turned journalist and sometime Robert Maplethorpe model, who since 1989 has run a downtown Manhattan outfit called Miss Vera's Finishing School for boys who want to be girls. <laughs> Interesting. She had become close with Royale in 1983 after a baby shower where she and a group of other women in the sex industry, including Annie Sprinkle, Veronica Hart, and Gloria Leonard, 
shut down the party dancing together to West Side Story. They started meeting regularly as Club 90, named after Sprinkle's street address, sometimes described as the first porn star support group, which also staged self-aware performances at downtown art spaces. And when Royale fell ill with ovarian cancer, they rallied to tend her and her legacy. When the Schlesinger came calling, Vera asked why the library wanted the archive. Kamensky explained that it already had the papers of Dworkin, McKinnon, and the group Women Against Pornography and wanted the other side. Fair enough. Salad says, my first exposure to feminism was anti-porn books in the library. It's a good start, but these books focus too much on the foreground and not enough on the background. These anti-porn books focus on the image uh, first, but they don't address the horror stories behind the scenes. Radical says, women definitely consume a lot of written erotica. I don't necessarily have a problem with that as a medium, but of course, often the content is problematic. And I agree, as a medium, totally fine. Um, and yeah, sometimes the content can be problematic for sure. That was very meaningful to me, Vera said. For so long, it's always the anti-porns that get quoted and the people that actually work in the industry are left out. Okay, I mean, I'm like not really sure how I feel about that because it, what is to quote there? Like what what do they bring to, you know, they're, they're opinions on this they're really just echoing the status quo so i don't know do we really need to hear from them more like it's the anti-porn feminists who are really going against the grain and i don't know erotica should not be part of any liberation movement i totally basically agree since arriving at the Schlesinger, the Royale papers have become an anchor, as Kamensky put it, for additional sex-positive acquisitions, like the archives of Club 90's other founding members and the papers of Jeanette Zinkin, a.k.a. Mistress Antoinette, a clothing designer who helped popularize PVC fetish wear. In 2017, Kamensky taught a research seminar, Feminisms and Pornography with Janet Halley, an expert on feminist legal theory at Harvard Law School. Beforehand, she invited Halley to look through some of the Royale collection, which had started arriving. You would take stuff out of a box and glitter would fall all over, Kamensky recalled. This was not the papers of Betty Friedan. Dreams of Becoming Famous One morning last December, the library's curator for gender and society, Jenny Gottwalls, and a senior archivist, Mark Vassar, had laid out a sampling of the archive. There was no loose glitter and no pizza, saucy or otherwise, but there was a mannequin in a staff jacket from High Society, the pornographic magazine for which Royale was a columnist in the 1980s, and a suggestively shaped award trophy for hottest group you-know-what scene. So here is Royale's first diary began uh, New Year's Day, 1962, when she was 11. The archive includes journals she kept nearly continuously for more than 40 years. Lee says, can anyone imagine Barbara Smith, Andrew Dworkin, or Stormy Delarvey advocating for feminist porn? Salad says, look at all liberation movements, decolonization, anti-imperialism. No one talks about erotica. Great point. Great point. Um, and Lighten says, I think all forms of sexual media should be removed from radical feminists. It doesn't do justice for women, even if some women feel like they need it somehow. I mean, right. It doesn't really have, it doesn't like do anything for us. 
Um, yeah. Mostly the tables were covered with diaries, letters, scrapbooks, photographs, and ephemera that Royale, a budding archivist, even as a child, Kamensky writes, had carefully preserved. Royale was born Candace Vidala in 1950. So not that she wasn't that old when she died, I guess, into a Catholic working class family on Long Island. Her father, Lewis, was a professional jazz drummer who was given to rages. When Candace was two, her mother left the family. Candace never saw her again. That's an interesting uh, origin story. So we're supposed to see pornography through this woman's eyes as this kind of liberating, empowering, like positive thing. And just like so many women in the sex industry, she just did not have the best beginning to her life. And this is like, she comes from a very disempowered place, even beyond the average just being female. Um, she grew up without her mother and with a father who sounds abusive. Nick says, nobody talks about decolonizing our minds from all of the male input we've had since birth, including erotica. And something that has stuck with me is existential, uh, not expired milk. I always get you two mixed up, but um, expired milk said um, that we need to really uh, stop thinking that um, male attention holds value. And I think a lot of this sex work pornography stuff is based around that idea that male attention holds value. And ever since expired milk said that that's been in my head, that's one of those things that's a little light bulb moment for me. Like, um, all of this is based around male attention. Male attention actually, it it's either has no value or it has negative value. Um, it, it's one of the two. It does not have a positive value, but a lot of women orient their lives around male attention as if it has any kind of monetary value. It really doesn't in the long run. Um, or, right, uh, this is a great point. Male attention is cheap. Men will give their attention to really anything, and it, there's a voluminous a demand for any of this stuff. You could be just the, the biggest, like, nobody, right? And you start putting uh, sexualized content out there, and they will come out of the woodwork. Um, it, it's, it's actually mind-boggling to me. It's been mind-boggling to me for a long time, the volume. Um, I did a video a while ago where I mentioned this, uh, I mentioned this video that was um, an investigation into this website called backpage.com. I think we meant, we talked about this on the last stream too, but um, there, any time in this investigation, they would put up a, a listing for a child prostitute within five minutes, they'd have 50 calls. Like, it's like, you know, locally from men who were just in that area who were on that website who were looking for a child prostitute. Like, it, it's just mind boggling, the volume. I think it's something that women really, really don't understand is like, just the volume, how crazy it is. Inspired Milk says popular feminism seems to focus on sexual repression more than anything. That's number one on the agenda. Always women would be dandy if they weren't always so sexually repressed, do porn and be free. And it's very like coercive. It's sort of that same idea of like, oh, you don't want to turn into an, an old hag or something. You don't want to turn into a crusty cat lady or whatever. Like it's, it's like putting this fear in women that they're sexually repressed if they don't want to be having sex or 
performing um, or presenting themselves in a sexual way like 24 seven, that that's actually a problem or a pathology even. I mean, I've been called pathological for my stance on all this stuff. So um, it's totally wild, but yeah. Let's continue on with the story. So uh, Royale, she had this kind of very tragic like upbringing. Uh, Lewis remarried and the family eventually settled in the Bronx where Candace started her first diary in 1962. The small red leatherette volume complete with flimsy brass lock is full of entries about girlish crushes and family fights, usually illustrated with a drawing of her outfit that day. But in an entry from 1963, she describes a sexual assault in a park near the family apartment accompanied by another drawing. I had my leotard on. Thank God, she wrote. It's horrid riding in a police car. I mean, it kind of is pretty self-explanatory. I feel like I don't need to elaborate on this. And I think, you know, something that radical feminists get criticized for is like casting these women as victims and that's like really disempowering right like you said oh you're a victim like like it's the radical feminist taking her power away by calling her a victim and there's one thing women really do not a lot of women are very uh, reluctant to accept that victim narrative but this is like factually if you're a victim of a crime you could recast it as survivor if that makes you more comfortable, but like this is a factual reality. I think the entree into like sex work following this traumatic upbringing is kind of a misguided attempt probably to reclaim this sexuality, right? Like you had your innocence stolen from you and your kid, 13 years old like so sad and you came from an abusive household and stuff and you're like how can i re change the narrative of my life um and that may be kind of like common for women right a photo collage from one of royale's scrapbooks from the 1970s It says, pardon me, sir. What was that you just said? Oh, me pose for a picture? Oh, surely you just. Look into my eyes and say that, mister. Candace and her sister were also preyed on by their father who exposed himself to them and demanded lover kisses. Oh. <laughs> He read their diaries, sometimes adding lewd comments and propositions, some still visible, Kamensky notes, despite his effort to erase them. So I think from an archival standpoint, like this is a really important addition to the collection. I was saying uh, earlier, like how they're saying, oh, well, you always hear from the anti-porn side. You never hear from the pro-porn side. And as far as their message is about why pornography is valid, excuse me are like not necessarily something we really need to hear about. The history of these women is really important because this actually ends up being anti-porn also, right? Like so many of these women come from abusive situations. This is not like to say, oh, this is like the way they're going to find liberation. It just seems a very, very misguided. Yes, existential says everyone ignores that so many sex workers have history histories of rape and incest. Um, it is so common. So how could the thing that was the source of your abuse also be the thing that's the source of your liberation or empowerment? It doesn't make any sense. Like it does not make any logical sense that the same root of your abuse is the root of your empowerment. 
Um, Salad says, someone should really link hypersexuality with self-harm. I see the pattern. Someone hurt you, so you're exposed yourself with more hurt, thinking it makes you stronger. It is really self-harm. I think that's such a great, insightful comment. Um, and existential says lover boy pimp schemes rely on attracting men pulling women into their web and they're often abusive too, right? Like, sorry, I'm, I'm like dying a little bit here. <clears throat> I got a tickle in my throat. Uh, the whole heal yourself by reenacting your trauma, but this time you're in control is straight up gaslighting. I totally, 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 totally agree. Um, and I Scott says found out that Nevada is the only U S state where prostitution is legal. I hate it. Archival ethics can be tricky even when there's no sex involved. How much right does a researcher have to publish the most intimate and traumatic details of people's lives? I agree after their their, um, after they've died, right? They have no say in it. It's not speaking ill of the dead, but it's, uh, revealing things that maybe they didn't want revealed. I mean, yeah, like feeling like your own private personal stuff is like out there out of your control is so disturbing. And then like to think, I mean, when you're dead, you're dead, right? Like, you're, you're not experiencing anything. So, but still, still, especially like people who know you are still alive. She died kind of relatively youngish. So her contemporaries are still alive and they're going to read about this stuff. It's a little dicey. That's a little dicey for sure. <clears throat> Writing during her final illness, Royale wondered if her journals and photographs would end up in junk stores and flea markets where strangers would paw at my memories without even knowing my name. But it wasn't a burn this moment, Kamensky said. I think she feels deep ambivalence about parts of her work and her world, Kamensky said, and yet she documented it. Okay, so she herself did feel ambivalent. Like, I think this is like an important important voice to archive. Vera, the executor who is currently preparing her own archive to send to the Schlesinger, agreed. So some more tidbits here. An Easter themed collage in the archive. It's also cool because these like collages and writing, it's all like the creative expression of a woman, right? She might be a woman who like we disagree with on a lot of things. Um, but I don't know, like, yeah, she was a creative woman who had a lot of misfortune in her early life. And so she took like this sort of wrong turn in my opinion. Um, but I would say she like made the best of it by, by keeping her creativity, but it's like, oh, if only she could have expressed her creativity in some other kind of art form, you know? And a drawing from Royale San Francisco years. So that's kind of like a really interesting looking drawing there. A body with like mirrors and windows and music notes. So kind of like, yeah, very interesting. And she would have been a teen, you know, adolescent in that sort of, I just read a book about the late 60s, early 70s and politics and culture and hippies and all this stuff. And it's just like, it was such a totally tumultuous, revolutionary time. And so she would have been growing up like right in the middle of that time too. The diaries seem to be written with the idea that someone was going to read them later, Vera said. There was this idea that she was going to be famous. As a girl, Royale studied ballet and dreamed of being a famous dancer, as she wrote at age 11 in a letter to her future self titled My Secret Diaries. 
1972, after leaving the Col City College of New York, she went to San Francisco where she worked odd jobs and performed with avant-garde troops like the Angels of Light and an offshoot of an anarchic drag collective, the Cockettes. In elaborate scrapbooks, collaged with photographs and psychedelic drawings, Royale, a name she started using in 1974, records her desire to make it as an artist. Like others in her circle, she dabbled in escorting and nude modeling to pay the bills and shot a few loops, short, blunt films that played on repeat in X-rated arcades. Interesting history is so different than pornography today, but it kind of set the scene for the pornography that we have today. Like these things did be, it, it was like a, it's like a frog boiling in water. Like it's like a slow boil, right? That these things became normalized. Oh, they're there. They're disgusting, but we're not really going to do anything about it. And then as technology changed, it became, you know, it went from, you had to go to the theater to, to see this stuff or whatever arcade and then you would go to a video store and they had a room in the back with a curtain or whatever and then it now it's all online so so um in 1975 she scored a part in the heartbreak of psoriasis a musical starring divine which she hoped would be her big break it closed after three performances in her diary, she declared herself a failure once and for all. No more middle of the road stuff, she wrote. If you're not going to do straight legitimate theater, you're going to have to shock them. So she became kind of disillusioned with failure and probably needed to make some money. And I just want to like contrast this image. So this is a promotional image from the 1978 pornographic comedy Hot and Saucy Pizza Girls. Royale is second from the right. So she's right there. But just like to contrast how, I mean, kind of natural these women are, their bodies, their hair. Well, the hair is not so natural. Their faces, like just to the kind of like cartoonish way that women in pornography are today. Like they just look more or less like the girl next door or whatever. And I feel like that was somewhat common back then, right? It wasn't everything was so plastic like it is now. It's plastic surgery, plastic bodies. Exactly. It's almost quaint in a way. Like, it just, uh, yeah. <clears throat> In the months after, she shot seven loops and two X-rated features. And porn, as Kamensky put it, is a door she walks through that turns out to swing only one way. Okay, so there's another thing. If porn was so empowering and liberating and all this stuff, why is it that if you do it, it closes off all your other options in life. Like now you cannot ever go back and get a real job because you're out there in that way, you know? Um, Juliet says plastic surgery was still a thing back then, but it was more subtle. Yeah, definitely. And I don't think it was as widespread either. Uh, like it's so normalized now. Like now, especially there's this kind of gateway in with fillers and lip injections, Botox, and all of that stuff, That's that gets you in the door of the plastic surgeon's office without, um, you know, like going in for a huge procedure. But then it's like, oh, well, I've done that. And then when it comes around, like, oh, my body's not perfect. Maybe I'll fix something else too, you know? So... Lissa says, that's how I feel when I watch the first couple seasons of reality TV shows and old movies. They look like real women. Yeah, we've really gotten away from women looking like actual women. And Juliet says, preventative Botox. Yeah, exactly. Like girls, I don't know if you guys saw that story, but there was a story of, I think it was like a 22-year-old girl or something. And and it was going around and they were like, you look like you're 45. And it's like... um because she had so much Botox and filler and stuff in her face. And 
she's like, well, I, I know I look older, but 45, come on. Why are girls putting anything in their face at any age? But my God, you're 22. Just like enjoy it. You, you probably look great to begin with. Ugh. Kamensky's account of Royale's years in Los Angeles, where she moved in 1976, hoping to break into real acting, evokes the rollicking golden age of porn captured in the movie Boogie Nights. She had a brief appearance in an orgy scene in Blake Edwards 10, where she was credited as third female sex performer. But mostly she made porn, ultimately appearing in nearly 50 films. Her diary entries from those years are edged with both pleasure in her beauty and power and despair at feeling stuck. During a 1980 tour of strip clubs, she wrote, Each time I know I have to go on stage soon, I feel like screaming and crying. Again, this is someone who is on the pro-porn side, or like they cast it, she's kind of in a gray area, but, you know, it's the more pro porn side. And yet it's really a lot of this is reading as pretty anti porn. So they could easily say, put this amongst the Andrea Dworkin, Catherine McKinnon archives, because this is really telling the truth about it. We don't get told the truth about this stuff too often anymore. Well, we get fed is like this one kind of message about it. Existential says, I'll be 45 this year and I definitely look, look it. Can't imagine injecting myself with toxins. I agree. And I can't imagine putting makeup on my face either at this point. Like um, the idea of putting that toxic stuff on my face. I mean, I've become, I have OCD about toxins and stuff anyways. No. It's just a no. So this is a really interesting photo right here. In 1984, Royale, second row at left. So I guess that would be here. And other current and former porn actresses appeared in a show at Franklin Furnace, an avant-garde avant Manhattan arts venue. Performers were invited to ponder a question, could there be feminist porn? Mm. So ever since feminism has been fighting all of this stuff, there have been women who push back on it and try to recast things that are disempowering as empowering. Because it's easier to do that, to accept these disempowering things, than to fight against them. So it's easier to say, you know what? Uh, I I like these chains. I like them. I feel good wearing them. They feel good. I enjoy it. And that's, I doesn't, I don't need to get rid of them. I like it. That's definitely easier than going against the status quo. That's, that's the much harder route. That year, Royale and her new husband, the son of a Swedish pornography producer, moved to New York where she started writing for the booming sex press, sometimes critiquing the sexist cliches of hardcore pornography. So she was sometimes a critic while still being a part of it. In 1984, she and Lauren Nimi founded Femme Productions with the goal of making woman-centered films intended for couples who could now watch porn from the intimacy of the bedroom thanks to the VCR. So it's for couples, but it's really for the man and the woman is going along with it. I think that's a fair... You know, it's not like if you're in a hetero couple, it's like the man who's going to be suggesting, hey, honey, do you want to watch this video? And then the woman is like begrudgingly, okay, fine. Because it's it's not so degrading, right? Um, Femme's first release did not include a single external male orgasm, as Kamensky puts it. The venture put Royale in collision with the rising anti-porn feminists who had allied with conservative politicians gross. Something I've talked about many times over the years. I don't care like what 
they're saying like it's just not worth it to make alliances with conservatives ever let them do their stuff on for you know fine whatever they agree with us on that fine they can let's do it over here you know there's too many like things conservatives ultimately hate women too so like yeah Kamensky describes a chaotic 1985 episode of Donahue where Royale and other pro-sex feminists debated McKinnon, who icily declared that their attempts at enlightened pornography had failed. Wow. So this author of this article, I think, really has an issue just by if you look at the language. I'm always talking in these streams about think about the words they're choosing to describe things, right? Icy is a real like misogynistic kind of word, right? And icy means, oh, you're not fun. It means you're not, you know, you're sexually repressed, basically. So, and, you know, looking at the chat, Enlightened says, I will say male standards and performing them isn't a natural state for women. The porn stars of the past might appear more natural but they still weren't in a way. Royale's archive includes plenty of mail from grateful women, like one who wrote under her husband's name on Muppets stationery, and another who reported watching femme films with her mother. Weird. But the company struggled financially while the mainstream industry became, Royale lamented, a trash heap of over-the-top extremities of the most violating acts. Um, and I guess here she is with some awards, critics, adult film awards. And a new type of empowered, media-savvy porn queen, to her dismay, was ready for it. Kaminsky quotes Royale's bitter frustration at Jenna Jameson, who's 20... 2004 tell all how to make love like a porn star reportedly sold 150,000 copies in one month. A few years later, Royale made notes for a memoir called sexualized to no more my journey in and out of the porn business. No publisher wanted that book. Watching porn with the parent sounds really bad. Yeah, I agree. That's super creepy. Um, the V word. There are many unprintable words in Kamensky's book, but few as charged as the V word victim. What were we just talking about? Victim. They cannot ever see themselves as victims, no matter what they're doing or what is being done to them or in what way they're being exploited. They, they have to recast exploitation as empowerment in order for their narrative to make any sense in their head. For anti-porn campaigners, women in the sex industry were victims of brainwashing or worse. McKinnon, a lawyer, at one point represented Linda Loveless, star of Deep Throat, who said her husband had forced her to appear in the film at gunpoint. Kaminsky describes how one of Royale's friends suggested she call the biography from victim to victor, but in truth, Kaminsky writes, she, always, she was always both. So here are some of her diaries. These days you can pay $9.95 to stream femme titles like Three Daughters, a tastefully upscale tale that Time Magazine called A Cross Between Debbie Does Dallas and The Waltons. Or you can just go to porn sites where a search for Candida Royale yields free slices of hot and saucy pizza girls along with a clip labeled Weird Retro Orgy. <laughs> Today, Kamensky said you can see as much of her career in exactly the way she would want least. You can see much of her career in exactly the way she would want least. Um, yeah, that's kind of like weird retro orgy. It's like it's a, definitely like a humiliation. Um, what does femme titles mean? Is that her company? Yes, that was her company. Pay attention 
Today, Kamensky said, you can see much of her career in exactly the way she would want least, but how we see her life story is a different question. Vera said she hoped the biography would further Royale's goal of expanding what a feminist is. Interessante. Royale herself never stopped her inner explorations in 2013 during her final illness. So she did die pretty young. She was 63-ish. She wrote in her journal, still trying to unlock the key to myself. Fascinating article. Let's look up Jennifer Schusler, the author. She... Uh, that's really creepy. Harvard removes binding of human skin from book in its library. Um, so she seems to write somewhat about academics, kind of cerebral topics. Interesting. Thanks, Jennifer Schusler, for that fascinating article. And thank you all for your wonderful chats. Um, I thought that was pretty interesting. I really am against the idea that there's any such thing as feminist porn or that it should be part of feminist movement or anything. Um, thanks for being here, Radical. Love you, girl. Uh, we need to redefine what dying young is. Dying young before 75 is being normalized. Yeah, dying any time before a full life expectancy, I would call dying young for sure. Like 63 is definitely young. Like you got more life to live at that point. Um, Carla says this continues to prove that any attempt to make female self-sexualization feminist is impossible. And I totally agree. It's sort of... Yeah, it did. The, I'm surprised because when I first looked at that article and I scrolled through, I was like, oh, it looks pretty long. And it didn't seem that long, although it did take us an hour to read it. But um, it didn't go too in depth into like what her life or anything, really. It was kind of uh, kind of glossed over it a bit. But, you know, it did. Um, actually, I was going to look at some of the comments. Ah, now I have to op open it again. All right, give me a second here. Usually do that. Take a look at the comments. Yes, let's go back there. So what did you guys, oh my gosh, I'm failing here. Woman who, there we go. What did you all think about the article? Okay, let me share my screen again. Okay. One can make a very serious argument that the prevalence and ease of access to this form of entertainment, which many millions of people in America are addicted to, is responsible for many of the very real issues young men and women face today. We are seeing many more people satisfied with sitting inside all day, replacing real, lasting, fulfilling relationships with virtual ones, pacified by brief moments of fleeting pleasure, which is no substitute for the real thing in any regard. To me, this form of entertainment is the antithesis of feminism. Top comment here, y'all. I'm telling you, the comments in the New York Times lately have been more and more radical, and we love to see it, okay? This stuff is becoming actually mainstream, kind of. Like, people are willing to, you know, acknowledge this. Uh, just because we can doesn't mean we should, and I'm tired of pretending otherwise. The boys on the left, right, and the middle have one thing in common, the subjugation of women in some form. On the right, it's about women's prescribed roles for as wife and mother. On the left, it's predatory patriarchy disguised as sexual freedom, and in the middle, it's a shrug. 
How could anyone read about Royale's childhood and not realize she was objectified, assaulted, and sexualized as a child by her father, and that likely set a course for her? It seems she tried to come into her own in some way later in life, yet it was all around sex and the industry that is designed for men, whether or not you call it feminist. Every woman has the right to define herself. At the same time, we are foolish to think we can somehow conjure up a warped notion of empowerment and exploitation that feeds patriarchal objectification. It's not progress. So the top two comments here are both pretty radical. Um, so that's pretty good. Salad says, article is so depressing. She is drowning and wants other women to drown with her. It's a tragedy like a drug addict proposing you drugs. It it sounded like she just was kind of a mess, not again, not to speak ill of the dead, but like she didn't seem super committed to the whole thing. And then she tried to re by making her own production company and making woman centered feminist porn for couples or whatever. It's like she was trying to remedy this thing that she definitely did see problems with, but you can't like fix it by doing more of the same. You know what I mean? Yes, exactly. Why try and find a loophole for feminist porn and erotica? We can move past that idea as a whole. Um, as if feminist porn would ever make a dent in this $2 billion industry. And it's because like, there's just not really a market for this stuff either. Like this is not the, you know, if, if, such a woman-centered porn really existed that's not something men would watch anyways and then women aren't interested in it so there's not even a market for it and like it's not gonna do anything yeah um i have a visceral reaction as well <laughs> no no worries about that um heather says there's no way anyone can defend porn today it's caused so much damage that's obvious to everyone it seems like people are always trying to find like justifications for it it's existing again it's like oh it's easier to try to it's like it's like cognitive dissonance right it's like easier to change our opinion about it than change the reality of it like the reality is it's awful but if you tell your but the reality is it's awful and we can't do anything about it, right? Like it's just too, it's like guns or something. Like it's just, there's just too much of it out there to ever like put it back in Pandora's box. So you have to change your opinion of it and you have to be like, well, I guess it's actually okay. I guess it's actually liberating. Um, that's cognitive dissonance, you know? Lissa says the right wants women's bodies to be private property of one man. The left wants women's bodies to be public property of all men. And that is just such a concise and very good way of stating that. So then we get the third top comment. I'm thankful for from a man. Presumably these first two are maybe from women. We don't know, you know, the username's a man's name. I'm thankful for people like Candida Royale. They help us explore the polarity of freedom and responsibility. Her willingness to be transparent about her life with a mix of apprehension and self-criticism is a contribution to the human story. It's wonderful that Harvard in this instance was willing to preserve the resources allowing us to study and learn. And I actually agree with that comment. Um, I thought it after seeing this, it was going to go in a different direction. But yeah, it's like she, she had mixed feelings about it and i actually do think like it fits into the anti-porn narrative like her story fits right into the anti-porn narrative you could it's just how you look at it and how you cast it you could say yeah she was pro-porn feminist like because she started a production company but ultimately it was a failure and when she reflected back on her own life she just wasn't really sure about it you know what i mean so it wasn't like and the fact that her story was so sad too. You are wrong on Andrea Dworkin. She did not dismiss female porn actresses as stooges. Dworkin herself did sex work when she was younger. She knew from experience that most women in the business had been abused in the past and the porn industry continued that cycle of abuse. Dworkin's argument was that porn was a type of anti-woman propaganda, brainwashing men into seeing women as objects to live out their violent and sexual fantasies on. So I like, this is exactly how I see it. It's 
all our actions and everything we do, it, it kind of informs the way people look at people in our class. So what you do as a woman actually does impact the way men, you know, see all women and what these women do impacts the way men see you. Right. So, um, it, it is in our sense, our responsibility to like represent women kind of well. Um, thanks for joining us, Lee, and thank you for your support as well. Uh, yeah. Salad says 50 shades and it's damages to society, even BDSM people hated it. And it's objectively like a terrible book. Also, I've not read the entire thing, but I have read passages and I just can actually can't believe how terrible the writing is. Um, because BDSM people don't look like looking at themselves critically. Um, Carla says she's a cautionary tale. I agree. I agree. Let's see. Um, Dworkin's attempt to ban porn cited studies showing that men who watch porn regularly were more likely to commit sexual violence. So it's, it's literally has that cause and effect, you know, Andrea Dworkin has been dragged through the mud enough. I expected better from the New York times than to repeat tired tropes about this woman. Please read Andrea Dworkin, the feminist as revolutionary by Martin Duberman. He did a fast, fantastic job of explaining Dworkin's history and Phil philosophy with a sympathetic but not always uncritical eye so um i'm socially liberal and i believe people should be free to do what they want with their bodies and categorically disagree with most conservative positions on bodily autonomy but i do understand conservative aversion to porn i still think people should be free to do what they want with their bodies including sex work but the secular left's dismissal of porn as a normal healthy part of human development and this idea that anyone who doesn't take part is a puritanical prude is misguided with everything we know about the dopamine circuits uh, how, how is it that the same people who claim to love and follow science are so dismissive and naive about the harms of this indulgence? Millions are suffering from porn addiction. This is like, why are we talking somewhere about how feminism also benefits men? <laughs> like this is one way, right? Like, um, you know, obviously the primary people suffering from this are women, but this is actually also like a thing. Obviously, it is not feminism's primary concern, certainly the men who are impacted by this, but there are many men who are negatively impacted by porn addiction. And, um, you know, you have 18 year olds who have erectile dysfunction and stuff like that, like, whoo, you know? So I've said it before, I'll continue to say it, is that feminism is about the liberation of women, but it, its side effects are that it also benefits men in many different ways as well. Um, Ice Goddess, tiny violin, for sure. I saw some of Royale's femme productions back in the late 80s during my first marriage. I don't recall any titles, but one in particular was a really lovely scene of two nice looking people having what honestly looked like good, satisfying sex. I've also read Dworkin and other anti-porn authors. I'm sorry to hear Candida Royale has died, but glad her archives have landed somewhere. They'll be accessible to scholars. Um, she was very smart, beautiful, but tough, sweet in an odd way too, but mainly smart. Glad to see she's getting scholarly attention. So, um, There you go. Okay. Now I think, now I think we're done officially uh, with the article. So I thought those comments were really very, very good. Adrian says, New York Times top comments are impressive. I'm surprised. They've been really like kind of pretty radical lately. And I'm I am pleased. Um all these articles we've been reading, like people are either like getting on board or they've been on board and they're just speaking up. Uh, Radical says Ted Bundy said pornography motivated a lot of his crimes. It's definitely, you know, hey, when we talk about um, educating men, 
training men, teaching men, whatever. Like, there's many women in this uh, chat who think like there's a biological, um, evolutionary, genetic, whatever uh, element to men's violence and sexual violence and stuff like that. Um, to the extent that there is a socialization aspect of it, this is exactly like what we're talking about, right? Like that, um, you know, men who are violent, like Radical pointed out Ted Bundy, like they, they are primed, you know, they may have that already biologically like in them to do those crimes but like this it's not helping <laughs> um yeah i agree something did shift i don't think we would have seen the top comments looking like this four years ago i totally agree i think it's it's a good thing it's like wow uh the average person out there like the top upvoted comments are they agree with us? This is why I was saying, I think I was saying this the other day or somewhere like um, feminism, radical feminism, even they would call it radical. Um, I was just talking to my dad about this the other day. And he's like, you know, you need to rebrand. Like you can't call it radical anymore because people just associate radical with terrorism or something. And that's not what you're about. And I'm like, I know it is radical in a sense, but it's also very bland. Like we're saying women are human beings. A lot of people on the surface would agree with that, although a lot of our society really reflects that we don't actually feel that way. But the idea of like, you know, that's pretty bland, like saying a woman is a human being. It's like revolutionary and it's bland at the same time. I'm not really surprised by seeing that like people have these kind of radical feminist opinions in the comments, but... I don't know. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it's definitely like dominated by that. I do think, yeah, probably four or five years ago, it would have been more, it would have been more liberal feminist. And you don't even really see any liberal feminist opinions in there anymore. So one of those comments was about how the person agreed with conservatives or whatever. And it's like, you have to realize that on so many of these issues where we seem to agree with conservatives, we're coming at it from like a much different point. Someone said earlier, conservatives think that women should be men's private property, whereas progressives think women should be women's public property or whatever. And yeah, so we we both like feel that pornography is wrong, but for totally different reasons. And I I don't believe alliances with the right wing are a good thing. So Juliet says, I tend to see choice feminist viewpoints coming from Gen Z mainly. I think there are probably women in my generation too, who uh, have those kind of more liberal ideas. Expired says, women are human is too bland for people who go into existential crisis trying to define women, womanhood as a concept, but are pretty sure it has something to do with Instagram aesthetic. Yeah. Um, the idea that women are human, it is radical in comparison to how patriarchal our society is or how our patriarchal society is. Men ruling society is technically radical, but it's not seen that way due to where we are right now and where we've always been. It reminds me of the Ruth Bader Ginsburg quote that someone said, when, when will you feel that it's equal, uh, women's representation in the Supreme Court? She said, when there are nine women on the Supreme Court. And that just blew people's mind, just even the idea that you could have nine women on the court. Well, yeah, but there were nine men on the court for hundreds of years. So why is it so crazy to think about nine women? Because we just accept it. It's just taken for granted that, like, that's the way it is. The pyramid. The pyramid. So glad the youngins are waking up. It seems slow, but I still 
see it. Where is the pyramid? The pyramid. It's just something I think about. It, it lives rent free in my brain. It lives rent free in my brain. How to make that bigger. There we go. Lighten says, I don't think I would be a radical feminist at this point in my life if I wasn't a lesbian. I had never heard of any of this stuff uh, till I was like 34 or five. And I came into it by um, through the gender stuff. That was my route in when I was in gender critical uh, circles. I was still wearing a full face of makeup. I was still uh, still believed that sex work was empowering and I had never questioned any of those ideas until I found I found radical feminism. I had never heard of it, never never knew about any of this stuff, never heard of it. I really do think it's so well hidden. It's so well hidden, kept from us. It's not mainstream at all. And I don't know, it's like totally boggles my mind and impresses me when young women are like in this community and like, you know, or, or talking about these ideas. Cause I'm like, damn, like, where did you hear about it? Like it may also like, I, I grew up not, um, you know, there was no internet when I was growing up. So there was really no way to discover these things, I guess, unless you went to the library and like checked books out on it. And I was always interested in the idea of like feminism generally, but to me, it was the feminism that I knew. It was like, well, why would I? I didn't understand why anyone would ever say like, I'm not a feminist. You know, of course you'd be a feminist. You're a woman. Like, it doesn't make any sense to not be a feminist. And there's still women today who will say, I don't want to call myself a, a feminist. You know, Yo, Magdalene Burns, I think is is the reason I am here today. Like, 100%. I mean, I can attribute it to her when I think of the path that I took, yeah, because I found out about gender, uh, gender critical through her and, and then, you know, and, and when I entered that community, um, and I'm so glad that so many people, you know, like she had a really positive impact on a lot of us just by speaking the truth it was like i think that was just unbelievably refreshing to see a woman who just was had no fear at all too and i think i feel like i've tried to kind of have some of that myself like i mean she definitely was a huge influence on me just being like i'm just going to say these things that are true why not you know like they are true. So why should we be afraid of it? Why should we be afraid to speak the truth? It is literally like factually true stuff. Um, so, and, and I like hope that I encourage someone and pass that along because, you know, yeah. Um, but when I entered that, like those gender critical spaces initially, and I still believed all this other liberal feminist stuff, the women were very quite kind to me and kind of guided me towards changing my thinking. So it wasn't like, a, you know, violent. It all came like very gradually. And then things like giving up makeup that had nothing to do with feminism and giving up shaving had nothing to do with feminism either. I just wanted to, you know, I'm a minimalist. I wanted to like reduce my routine and stuff like that. So just so was easy to do. Um, and yeah, so I, it's, it's, we're, we're also brainwashed with this stuff that has to be kind of like a gradual thing, I think for a lot of us. Um, 
Juliet says, I definitely came to this through the Moya, Maya four-stater story and the iconic, this is not a drill JKR tweet. Yeah, I think uh, JK Rowling definitely did a huge part in, I've heard a lot of women say that JK Rowling is the reason they have come, come down this path and existential claps for you gave up makeup for good because of Lisa and radical. I think uh, I've heard that from a few women and I, I, the work is done, right? Like I feel satisfied to have even influenced like one or two people like, cause it's so, so important. It's like you made a choice for your health, you know, like that's a positive choice for your health, your well-being, your longevity and all that stuff. Ice goddess throughout all the makeup I got. Um, if I got a gift card and never used it. So Mark, more claps for ice goddess. We really appreciate that. Um, Kai says JK Rowling has been a beautiful force. She gets so much mudslinging. It's not bent the knee. Yeah. Very, very good. Very good. And yeah, I don't have too much more to say. So, um, we could start to wrap up, I suppose. Ophelia says, have ever only worn makeup for about a week when my sister uh, gifted me BB cream. She probably thought she finally got me on the road to femininity. LMAO. Salad says, never used makeup because I have acne problems. I also have a theory that like makeup um, makes you look older. <laughs> and like when you stop, like I do think it, it actually really does ha like damage your skin and injure your skin. And I think it causes wrinkles. I actually do feel I have fewer wrinkles at 40 than I did in my early 30s when I was wearing makeup. And it may also just be like, I stare in the mirror less. So maybe it's the same and I don't notice it or maybe it's worse, but I just don't notice it because I don't look in the mirror. But like, I do think it really does damage your skin. Um, it Pre it prevents like oxygen from getting to your skin. I don't know. I'm not a scientist. I don't know if that's important, but like, you know, all the chemicals and everything, like I really, really believe that. Yeah. Tugging on your skin to get the makeup off. Um, oh, thank you for joining the stream. Appreciate it. Um, it settles settles in the creases. I always thought I was doing it wrong. I don't think you were, I don't, you know, I don't know how people get that like airbrushed look. I don't really care either, but, um, yeah, it's so, it's so blah, blah. right. In order to not have uh, creases and wrinkles and you have to do like an extremely thick layer of like primer and stuff to create like a mask basically on your face for the makeup to sit on. It's just so like the whole thing is so disgusting. Um, Ophelia says people often ask me why I rarely had pimples in my teens and even now for some reason they rarely come to the conclusion that it's makeup um, oh <laughs> and this is this is a huge reason too right I mean I've talked about it so many times all the very many 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 reasons to stop and I would like to eventually do a video about that at some point but yeah, the slave labor is a part of the makeup industry. Women and young girls mine the minerals that go into makeup. They specifically want small girls so they can crawl into the holes and mine the mica and stuff. Um, the whole industry is owned and run by men who do not wear makeup. So, yeah. There you go. There you go. So I want to thank you all for joining me this Friday. The men who make money off of makeup are not getting high on their own supply. They're not. They're not. Um, oh, this I've actually commented in some of these co these communities about zero waste people who still wear makeup. And I'm like, when are you going to stop wearing makeup? Because you don't need it. And they're like, they're literally 
cut so many almost kind of borderline necessary things out of their life, but they won't cut out makeup, which is completely not necessary at all. And like, and if you even question it, you'll definitely be called like a misogynist woman hater. Um, you know, really, it's really like they're so, they're so resistant to it, which is totally insane. Um, yeah, so, um, anti-capitalists be wearing makeup too. Yeah, I could just go, I could do a 10 hour stream about makeup and reasons not to wear it. I'm not going to do that, but, um, I think it's something to meditate on, like, why it, it, and it actually goes with this article we read today, too. Like, it's recasting something that is actually oppressive. It's bad for you. <laughs> it's bad for the environment. It's bad for the uh, women who work in the industry who are exploited. And what, yet we have to cast it as an empowering thing. I mean, there's been like, Liberal feminists, uh, AOC, um, she has said wearing red lipstick is, you know, source of power for her. I think Lena Dunham wrote a whole essay about how uh, wearing red lipstick is, you know, integral. Like it's as important as any other thing to feminism. I don't know, but I think it is important to like, uh, to meditate on it, man. I hate what lib femme did to terms like internalized misogyny. <sighs> yeah. Imagine it like being, being told that you're a misogynist or you, you're a self-hating woman or something because you won't wear makeup. Blah. Um, empowering is a feeling. It's not about actually obtaining power. That's what they think, right? That's why they're like, I feel good. If you di dig into it deeper, though, you would realize you don't actually feel good. You're just preventing yourself from feeling bad because they've told you that you should feel bad about your face. I feel very good about my face. I have nothing on it. Feel great about it. Um, that's what I want to convey. That's actually possible. It's actually possible to feel great about your face. I actually think I look good. Um, and they want you to believe that's not possible and they want you to feel bad about yourself. And it's a revolutionary act to not feel bad about yourself. So there you go. There you go. Well, I hope you guys have a great rest of your day. And I, I know I keep like trying to end this and then you keep guys keep saying really insightful things, but I totally, totally, totally agree. It's not petty. It's not a minor issue at all. It's a very major issue because it taps into the most basic idea that we exist as decorative objects rather than as human beings. And men don't do it. It's a total double standard. I, oh, I was saying in our little chat group that um, I was watching a video of the NTSB, the National Transportation Safety Board. They investigate accidents. As you guys might have seen, there was a huge bridge collapse in Maryland. And the chair of the NTSB is a woman. And she's very smart, like really articulate, right on top of everything, like really impressive, right? And she was doing this press conference and she's got like full face of like real legit makeup, you know, everything short of like fake eyelashes. And she had her nails done and they were like long, very done, you know? And, um, and then she was flanked by two of her colleagues who were male who look so dignified and human just by dint of they are appearing there with no makeup. And it's like, I think that people don't even see it. They don't even see it. They wouldn't even notice it. But I swear to God, once you see this stuff, it's everywhere. It's just like so 
it, it drives me nuts basically um, because it's so dehumanizing. It's like, why does that woman have to wear makeup? Why does she, why does she have to wear makeup to like be there and be professional? Neither of those men do. And they look like dignified. And you know what? She doesn't. And she's, she, like I said, she was so smart, so articulate. I'm assuming she's an engineer, like has risen to this extremely high and very impressive level of her career. But like, you know, and it, maybe, maybe it's just me being like overly nitpicky or whatever, but a woman in that position still feeling like her appearance is actually important. Those men didn't feel that their appearance was so important that they had to like put on a full face of makeup and get their nails done. But she did. Hashtag, uh, you know, I don't know. I'm just like, ah, I have to rant about this because I really do think it is just, it's a way that we are dehumanized and it may be like subtle and it may be subconscious and taken for granted, but it's not minor and it's not petty to bring this stuff up. It's very major. It's really major. <laughs> yes. And in fact, another thing, I saw a news report about that bridge collapse or whatever, and the woman, she just had her hair in a ponytail, the, the woman who was doing the news on scene or whatever. And it was because she was like up and about and on a boat and everything. And, and I was like, damn, you like never see a woman even just in like a ponytail. Like it's, you know, prom level makeup. It is so distracting. Once you see it, you, you will never go back to seeing it any, any other way, you know? So, I think I that's all I have to say. I really appreciate you all. Um, and I will see Peaceful Island in the Peaceful Island chat. And I appreciate all your chats. So, it's, chat was like really popping off today. And I appreciate you all. That's all I have to say. I will see you again next week. And oh, by the way, yes, we'll probably be on Radical's channel on Tuesday evening. So if you're not subscribed to Radical Ramblings, excuse me, um, please subscribe to her. Smash that like button or softly stroke it or whatever, you know, however it, it, it works for you. Um, I will see you soon. Bye, friends. Have a great Friday.